Now it's blinking. Probably the sound is on. Before you leave, we'll have to decide what will be the lecture next week. Don't suggest any other textbook. Only chapters in this textbook, OK? So if you have a long list of alternative literature, see you next year about this time, and we can discuss it, OK? But till then, we keep to the chapters here, OK? Uh, I guess there is a French group, and there is a German group, and they probably have coordinated their interests. And then I think it is close to a majority. OK. If you don't win it, just call Napoleon. He will help you out. OK. So before you leave, uh, so my suggestion would be quarter to four is the latest where you can come with wishes for chapters. Is that a fair deal? It gives you about two hours from now on. Two breaks where you can fight through all the alternatives and come up with one solution. We call this a Danish series on Norwegian television. They fight at the end and then decide. Okay? Very good. Today is chapter 12. Last week was chapter 11. The major focus in both chapters is this. What can develop economies in what we call developing world? And it might sound a little bit, let's say, not nice to the anti-globalization movement. But I think Krugman supports the idea of you might have heard the slogan, Occupy Wall Street. None of you. The fight against the 1% society. OK. There are two uh, rather uh, radical economists to compare to the conservative. Oops. There it is, under the table. Uh, that are strongly opposing to, let's say, uh, today's macro macroeconomic policies. One is Krugman and the other one is Stieglitz. Stieglitz was the one that uh, launched the slogan, the 1% society. So I think part of the anti-globalization movement is against the, let's say, uh, inequality in societies. So they're looking for a way to reduce the inequality or let, let's say, make the conditions more equal for those living in it. And the anti-globalization movement, I think <coughs> Krugman tries to tell you, is they might have a right agenda, but they could have chosen better arguments. Because if you believe in Ricardo, and I think after six or seven lectures, you know what Ricardo is about but you probably think it is a good idea. So that is the major argument against anti-globalization, simply because if you want to develop, you need one thing, according to Ricardo. Resources. More tra resources, more values of resources. And the best way to do it is trade, trade, trade. Trade more, not less, because then you can uh, utilize your comparative advantages. So if you wake up one morning, let's say on Sunday morning, with a headache, it's not because of Ricardo, but it is by a different reason. But every morning when you wake up and think of international economics, promise me one thing. Ricardo tells you that trade is beneficial for all countries involved, simply because you can utilize your comparative advantages, and get more out of your resources. And is it easier to develop with more than less resources? I think the answer could be quite clear. OK, very good. So what he's trying to tell is trade is not hurting anybody. It might be domestic's effect out of it, but that is a different story. 
So if you want to know what the problem is with Occupy Wall Street, we can take it after we have chosen the next chapter. Is that a fair deal? So after 4.15, I'll tell you, what is the problem with Occupy Wall Street? It's not a trade problem. It might be many like, sorts of problems, but it's not a trade problem. So when you woke, wake up on Monday morning after the headache is gone, trade is not the problem. Trade might be the solution. For most countries developing, there is no better ways out of it than, did I hear a choir? Trade is the answer. Simply because you have limited resources, the best way you can get more out of it is not to ban, but let's say support trade. Okay? It's not like supporting Paris Saint-Germain because they play football. Although it's international, it has nothing to do with trade. So trade simply is the most beneficial way to come out of, let's say, or into development. Was that a fair deal? So now we've concluded two chapters and you can go home, have your drinks, have your headaches, and come back next Wednesday. Okay, we get, we'll run into details. The anti-globalization movement is what we call an activist trade policy. Somebody forms a group and try to influence policy. And as far as I can see, none of you have the t-shirt of the anti-globalization movement. You are allowed to have one, although if you follow this course. That must be a fair deal, isn't it? Okay. So it's not a way to be banned from the lecture to pop up in one of these t-shirts. You can come as you will. The other point is you need probably to put labor standards into trade negotiations. If you want to improve the condition for those who have, let's say, least in society, probably you should put it into. And then our favorite argument, environmental effects. Environment means two things, as I think you know that. This is an environment, simply because there are several people in here, they're involved with each other, they have, let's say, uh, common interests, things like that. Then it is an environment. But that is not an environmental problem. Then we talk about emissions, toxic waste, and things like that. Okay? So we have to talk about that. So for those of you opposing it, we put it in the last lecture hour. Okay. Is that a fair deal too? So strong opponents can be here and argue against our argument, or you can do what you want. We think you need to solve some of the environmental problems globally. Is there any organization that can do that? I'm afraid not yet. But it is a global problem, and we will explain it before you leave, five minutes to five o'clock. So if I haven't mentioned it before, remind me of it. There is a reason why it has to be global uh, system to do it. Okay, then we are back to uh, early January, when we try to tell you what is it about international economics that is, let's say, the major focus. And the thing is, trade. So why do we trade? The German will say, because we have the money. The Norwegian will say, because we have the oil. The French would say, because we have problem with selling our Deutsche Wars. What do I know? But the major reason is simply this. We want to import something. What do we want to import if we are Norwegians or German cars? What would people, let's say, in Vietnam want to import? And the answer could be 
German cars. But why would some say French cars in Vietnam and not in Norway? Because it was a former colony. Of France. So they know that French firms produce cars. And if you ask them where is Germany, they will say, probably a colony of France. But that would be a wrong answer. But that is one simple reason. What do we want to import is simply the thing we don't not produce ourselves. Why don't you see any banana trees in Norway? Because it's too expensive. Uh, you have in, uh, in, uh, greenhouses and, uh, and uh, make a big effort to get the right temperature. OK. Because do you think you can find banana trees I in Iceland? Yes. Because they have the yeah, greenhouses. Yes, because, uh, because of the boiling water. Yeah. The, uh, the yeah. So if we had had boiling waters down here, we wouldn't have been looking for oil. We would look for boiling water because it's more environmentally friendly. But that we'll talk about later, OK? But some of these goods that we like to import, we do not produce ourselves. So that is the two major reasons. Because we cannot or because we don't know the technology, OK? So these are the major reasons. We need to import. And then you can look at Japan and say, did they produce cars before the Second World War? Not very many. Do they produce now? Yes, because they got the technology. It is a design of formal technology, but they can do it. Because no one can hinder them to copy a car and produce one. It's different from Germany, because they buy the companies. We call them, call them Skodas, don't we? But normally, they do not produce this because, let's say, they don't have access to the technology and things like that. So that is the major reason. We call it, in Ricardo's model, <coughs> indirect production, simply because we produce more of what we are clever to do, have comparative advantage to, get more values out of it, and use these values to buy this cheaper because we can buy it from another country that produce it cheaper. <coughs> what happens when you trade is the relative prices changes, and we call it terms of trade. It simply means the relative prices of two goods. That is terms of trade. Because there are two good economy, you import one, you export the other. What happens to export consumption in home is then it gets more expensive. And for those of you who have been to Norway for more than two months now, what happens if you have to buy more expensive goods? Yeah. If you buy? I have less money. OK. You can choose between having less money. <laughs> but since you're planning to you say, use your money, this is too expensive to use it on exporting goods, so we buy importing goods. That simply means that we do have our oil, but no cars. But since oil is so expensive for Germany, we can import more German cars, and French cars, and Japanese cars, because they do not have the oil that we got. So we export, get more money, so we can buy more goods, and we buy importing goods because they are cheaper. This is simply microeconomics. I think you are very good at that. At least it sounds like you are. So with lower exporting consumption at home, we can export more. So it's simply a mechanism to cut home consumption, to pay for a different consumption, and we pay with some of our production, which is now exported. So that is, in fact, the standard model. For those of you who still remember that there is a standard model, too. Because we were discussing three models before the standard model. Ricardo's, Hexer Orleans, and Samuels and so Jones. So the standard model is based on all these three. But all of them conclude with one simple thing. We have 
certain resources. We can use them for exporting or importing goods, since it's a trade model. If we export more, we can also import more. And if you have been a very, let's say, strong supporter, you said, hallelujah, Bayern Munich is through to the next round. <coughs> what happens to import is then it's half the price in some of the models. So if you can get it for half the price, most of you would buy to two of it, wouldn't you? Because that is what you can do when you go into one of these shops and they say, take two, pay for one. How many of you would pick one and leave without taking the other one? No, so that is standard theory. If you get it for half the price, let me have two. I need both. So all countries involved in trade can now utilize resources in a different production. All gain because they get more out of their production at home, and they can pay for more import. Guess who, who produce our importing goods? That is foreign, and they produce it as exporting goods. So there is a balance between import and export. Somebody imports what the other exports in a simple two goods, two country model. Isn't life easy? This is all about international economics. It's not more difficult than that. But I can understand it can sometimes be very hard to know, at least on Monday mornings, when you woke up on Sunday morning and didn't have a headache and spent all the Sundays and wondered, why didn't I have one this weekend? And then on Monday, you cannot come up with the easy but strong outcome of Ricardo. You benefit from trade, and you get more out of your resources, and all of us will be better off although there can be some redistribution domestically. That's a different study. So why do we introduce tariff? Why do we introduce quotas? Why do we use money on import substitution when these things reduce the value of your resources? And I've said, and I still will to, on behalf of all of us, take the responsibility because of politicians and the way society function. Because it's hard for those who suffer small, uh, let's say, uh, bad effects of it, to form a group. It's just when I choose chapter 22. But all of you think, OK, it's not the worst chapter you could choose. But if you could form a coalition, Walking around at the A building, hours and hours, days and days, then I probably would say, let's drop chapter 22. And that is the problem with trade policy. All of us suffers very little from it. So we think, oh hell, let's go. It's like being an Arsenal supporter. Next time, new chances. So that is what happens. But there are strong groups that have interest in pushing this through, OK? But Milan lost too. And they lost with, let's say, adverse result. So there are, let's say, hope for everybody. What happens with tariffs, quotas, whatever you do to reduce import? It changes the terms of trade and leaves us all better, worse off. But that is how life is. And since your name is Sue, Johnny Cash have made a melody of it. You have heard it. Probably. All of this reduction of production possibilities for export reduce the production possibility curve. So there are less to produce. So somebody must be insane in there, if you ask me, but don't tell it to me, because then I have to discuss it with politicians. They get less out of their resources. They can consume less. It's a lower welfare level. They could have been better off. 
In fact, they could have bought a very nice Christmas gift of it if they collected all of it. So then you will get your new six version of your iPhone, not sticking to the old five version. That is how life is. But because it's hard to form an opposition, that is the way it ends up. Because this changes the relative prices, makes it more expensive to buy the importing goods. So we buy less of it. But I don't think you should go out in the streets and kill somebody. It's not that important. OK, do you remember this one? It was in January 2014, so it's not many years ago. OK, that was at the time when Bayern Munich didn't know they were through to the next round. So it's a long time ago. Yeah, OK. But that is what it is all about. And I need my stick with the red point here. Maybe I should use this one. No. Then I have to calculate it. This is with no trade. This is producing what you are consuming. OK? So in this case, there is no trade. We consume what we produce. We produce what we consume. Then comes trade in. And it's just like a fairy tale. All of a sudden, all can be better off. So then we can shift from one to a different point. And we could end up here, which is the production where we have reduced consumption of drop clothes and say oil if you are Norwegian. Drop cloth if you are German, and then you say cars. Okay? So in here we have reduced the consumption at home. What have we done then is we have made it possible to export this volume. So this can be exported, 50% of it. The rest we consume ourselves. What should we use the money for? And we do that. So we shift to a different point where we now can import what we former couldn't import but had to produce ourselves. We save resources to double the production, letting the foreign produce it for us. And to me, that sounds a very reasonable deal, isn't it? They produce some of what we need because we can get it for half the price, and the rest we produce ourselves. <coughs> so it simply shows that consumption can be increased because we can leave the production curve and we can decide either to produce more of one or two or one and two, which we call a mix of the two. So we can choose both strategies. We need not produce only one or two, but we can choose also something in between. So that is the possibility to improve our welfare. Could we end up here? And the answer is, could we end up here? And the answer is, of course. But probably we end up in between, because this is one single point, and this is one single point. And then you can ask the French mathematicians and say, here there are a lot of points where you can end up. So two of them is only two. In between lies the most of them. So probably we end up in between. Doesn't that sound OK? It's like being a foot, no, a ski supporter. And these are 19 Norwegian skiers. It need not be the best one who wins, or the lucky one, but some of them will win. So it's also a mix of them that is possible. So more, no, more possibilities. And then you are good at statistics, too. OK, then you have to repeat your statistic courses, because this is statistic two in Norwegian. Homework to next week. 
we gain more simply because we can choose a different point. Okay? This means that the sun will set later tonight than it did last night. Therefore, the yellow color. Is that okay? We have a deal with the weather forecast. You see it's yellow? That is the thing on the ha uh, out on the blue skies sometimes when it's not too foggy. Okay. So this is what really happened. Here we have this effect. No trade, no trade. Two different pr production possibilities. Where do we end up? Depends on trade or not. If there is no trade, this is relative prices, and we end up with no trade. If relative prices changes, we can move from this point to a point in between. And this point is decided by the consumption. Why is it decided by consumption? All of you are very clever at microeconomics. Why is it decided by consumption? None of you remembers microeconomics. Consumers is sovereign in deciding in production simply because he's the one that pays for it. The company can produce more, but it depends on is it a consumer willing to pay for it. So therefore, this is not decided by production. It's decided by, by consumption, and both points could be realized. Point two. It also increases the production possibility curve, so you can produce more. Like you can see here. And this is another test question. Do we remember lecture number four? When we discussed hexerolene? No, no, don't. Okay. Changes in relative factor prices increases factor supply. So it simply supplied more factors. You can produce more of those goods. So trade improve, let's say, the prices for the factors offered in the market. And since this goes up, more of both products or goods. Why both? Is simply we produce them by two factors. So do you get more of one factor, then you can produce more of both goods. Does that sound OK? So since you have more factors available, you can produce more goods. Using both factors to produce both goods, you can produce more of both goods. This is the most intriguing part of e international economics. So probably now it's getting clearer. <coughs> then we are almost through the first 10 chapters. So if you wonder what you have learned by the first 10 chapters, is this part we have shown so far. So it's fairly small things to remember. So every time you wake up with a headache, it's not because there are so many topics in international economics. It must be a different course. OK? Yes. So yes, it is not too difficult to understand. And now we move into what do we do to develop? And that we were trying to explain last week. Some prefer to support a new industry. What are they producing? Is according to Krugman, import. If he could have chosen, who would put a cross over it and said, export production. Because there are in the market in the 60s, which is a long time ago, more than 50 years back, there were growing economies in the developed world. What do you do in a growing economy is produce more goods. What happens to prices if you produce more of them? If the demand is constant, the price will go. 
so it will be cheaper to buy them in the world market than use the resources at home. There are three reasons why it's cheaper to import them. One, they are produced in countries that know the technology already. So they already know the production and can do it cheaper. OK, that is one. Two, they can be produced in larger firms, in big volumes. And if there is economy of scale, they can do it cheaper. We call it the Vietnam paradox, if you remember that one. They can produce cheaper clothes in China, but even cheaper in, Chi in Vietnam. Why are they not producing them in Vietnam? They started in China. They already have the production. They already produce a lot. So anyone who is trying to enter that market, China can do it cheaper. Because it's so small, the extra volume, so they cannot compete. They cannot exhibit economy of scales. Although they have the potential, they never reach that amount of production like they do in China. So yes, it could be cheaper if it was from Vietnam, but they do it this way. They import Chinese, they Vietnamese workers to China. So if you wonder what is cheap in chi China, it's simply if it's done by Vietnamese. It's what we call in Norway the Polish worker effect. And some of you might wonder, what are the Polish workers in Poland? Who will be a Polish worker in Poland? And then you have to know geography. What is the nearest neighbor to the east that is poorer than Poland? No, that's to the south. To the east. It's not Ukraine. Belarus. Belarus. So there are always cheaper labor work, probably for any production. But those who started first have the advantage. So that is number two. They already produce. They can produce it lower than anyone else. So what is the third reason? It's easier to move labors than firms. So it's easier to hire a Vietnamese worker in China than build up a company in Vietnam. And if you don't believe me, just call somebody from Sunmer who is producing some ship down there. Who are you working with? And they will answer you partly in Polish because they soon speak more Polish in Sunmer than anywhere else in Norway because there are so many Polish workers. So it's easier to import the resources. OK. Then we are back to infant industry. Infant industry means that you start a production. During the production period, you learn. And probably like you do here, attending a lecture, you probably learn something. I wouldn't bet on it, but I hope you will. Okay? Learning means more knowledge. To the society, you are better off the more the people know in this society. Simply because they stopped producing Volkswagens and now they are starting to produce high-speed trains. They know the technology. They can put it into a high-speed railway too. So that knowledge is beneficial for all of us. So that is what we call creating knowledge. We call it an externality. And this is the most difficult part of your microeconomics. And now I'm very uncertain. What do you remember of the most intriguing part of your microeconomic courses? Not too much. Okay. Externality. What is an externality? It's simply explained before the French answer. What the market is not valuing. It's not put a value to it in the market. It is there somewhere, but no one has a value linked to it. But if you get the knowledge, and produce these high-speed rails, do you think you are money by it? Would it be profitable? Oh, sounds a little bit dubious, but probably it is. So then, all of a sudden, you can produce this, this, this extra knowledge. Without that, you couldn't. With it, you can. And that is an externality that gets a value when somebody uses it. 
but how can they use it if it's not created? So that is the argument for the infant industry. You can come up with new knowledge. That knowledge has a value. The market won't pay for it. Who has money to pay for it if it's not in the market? You have to be French to know. Because we call it Code Napoleon. And no one knows it. Not even the French. OK, you know where, who was Napoleon? Yeah. What was he doing? What was his main interest? Except women. He was fighting wars. How do you fight wars? You have to get extra money. How do you get extra money if you are an emperor in France? Taxes, taxes, taxes. So this is the way to give the public sector more money. Then the public sector has more money. Where should you put it into? Knowledge creating activity. Because no one would pay for it. Only the public sector would have the money. Why should they pay for it? This is simply microeconomic theory that you have already it's an investment. Yes. And it benefits all of us. So the society will get more money out of each of us, because now we can produce high-speed trains also. Not German cars, but German trains as well. And some of them will put money into a football club, which <coughs> let's say win tournaments and earn more money. So there are money into knowledge. And this knowledge would not be produced without public su support. And this gives you the extra resources. That's the argument for the infant industry. But we agree with Krugman et al. and say, if there are more goods on the world market, why should I produce it expensively at home and I can buy it cheaply abroad? It's uh, the inverse of going to Norway if you are a German student, so forget that part, OK? But yes, we can get it cheaper. What should we use the money for that we spend on import substitution now when we save it? My answer is start to produce something to export. So if you are in Vietnam, it could be clothes. If you are in Bangladesh, probably the same. If you are in Western Africa, my suggestion would be start to produce bananas and sell them to Iceland so they can instead produce passion fruit on Iceland because it's so much smaller and harder to transport. So therefore, yes, start to produce something that they would buy in the growing Western economies. And then in the 60s, somebody would say, no, it's not room for it. There are not room for any new products or new producers. And then the answer is the Asian wonder. What was the Asian wonder? Chapter 11, last part, should be read before middle of May, so you know what it is. OK. It was the newly industrialized countries. South Korea, Hong Kong, Malaysia. yeah, Singapore. which have a uh, an airway system that is not operating yet, and Singapore. Singapore. These were the new countries where they started to produce new products. Did they succeed? At least in the beginning. Still, I think they are quite successful. So yes, there are room for new products and new producers. OK? If you ask me if they should start to, let's say, produce fishery products out of Norwegian fish, I would say, no, we sell it to Paris, where they pay more for it. <laughs> so probably do your fishing yourself off the coast of Singapore. But there are potentials to so start to do it. And the reason is very simple. You earn more money out of it. You get more out of your resources. It changes with trade the relative prices. It simply means that we buy exporting goods from the rich 
develop world at a lower price, so we import them, and it costs us less. We save resources. What should we use them for? In Japan, in 1949, cars. Was it a success? If you ask me, who have been running Toyotas after I had my first car, which was a German Opel, then I shifted. And from then on, I never have used European cars. Not because they are more expensive. I don't say they are better. But for some of us, it feels like it is better. So yes, Japan did this in 1946, 47, 48. If you wonder if it works, I would say, look to Japan. And then you would say, yeah, Japan is running into problems. Yes, then look to China. So if you don't believe that Japan is a very good example, I say, look to China. Is it a success? Because now they are the second biggest economy in the world, beating Japan. So Japan was the first success. China is the next. And if you count in numbers, a bigger success. Because they are number two. Okay? If you look at me and ask me, will India be the second largest economy in the world? I'm not quite sure. Not because of the political system, because India is in a way democratic, Japan, China is not. But I don't think that is the answer. I think the answer is access to resources. What China has done, and none of you have been interested in so far, but will be from now on, they have bought companies and resources all over Africa. So if you want to learn Chinese and not go to China, go to Africa where you will find a nearby Chinese company that now control natural resources extraction somewhere in Africa. What do they use it for? Like Japan did in the 70s and 80s, produce Japanese products. Why produce Japanese products? Because they export them. Do they gain from it? No doubt. Will China gain from it? No doubt. Will there be other access, having access to those resources? No. Would China earn more money by it? Yes. So yes, start exporting production, not import substitution. And if you don't believe me, just call one of your English famed relatives that knows an Italian named guy that died 200 years ago about David Ricardo. He was the first one to come up with it. He proved that the best way to use resources is to exploit your comparative advantage. Then you get more out of your resources. If you don't believe me, call the Japanese prime minister and ask about the Japanese history. If you don't believe him, call China. But don't go to Beijing because it's so polluted that if you survive, you will come back with allergic problems for the rest of your life. So don't go there. Use Skype or teleconference. Okay? We are close to finishing the summing up of the 11th chapter. What about GDP, which is the gross domestic product? If you compare Norway to Vietnam, GDP per inhabitant in Norway is higher than in Vietnam. OK. Do Germany export cars to Norway? Because some of you have a German car, I'm afraid. OK. Do they export cars to Vietnam? But do they? Do they get the same money for exporting to Vietnam to compared to Norway? No, because they cannot pay for so much export like Norway can. So they pay less for German cars. So why do they sell it to Vietnam? They earn money of it. Not as much as they do in Norway. 
And therefore, before we have the break, I'll take the example of Norwegian furniture called Ekornes. Have you heard of it? Yeah. They sell what they call a stressless, which is a chair that can, okay. If you'd sell an Ekornes stressless in Norway, you get less for it than if you sell it in Beijing. You don't believe me? They do. You 15 minutes to come up with the answer. Why do they sell furniture from Econes, which is down south there, at a higher price in Beijing than they do in Norway? And you will have one hint, GDP, but not per habitant, okay? Inhabitant, okay? 15 minutes break, and still you can discuss chapter number 15 and 22 because you have still an hour to go. So far, so good. Enjoy the stay. I need hot water for my hot drink. <laughs>